clear path to citizenship for the 11 million. We're leaving the last few minutes of this, which you can see at cspan.org, to go live to the House for votes on measures debated earlier this afternoon. That's the right thing to do for our business. 1157 by the yeas and yeas. The first electronic vote will be conducted as a 15 minute vote. Remaining electronic votes will be conducted as five minute votes. The unfinished business is the vote on the motion of the gentleman from Washington, Mr. Hastings, to suspend the rules and pass H.R. 251, in which the yeas and nays are ordered. The clerk will report the title of the bill. Union calendar number 54, H.R. 251, a bill to direct the Secretary of the Interior to convey certain federal features of the electric distribution system to the South Utah Valley Electric Service District and for other purposes. The question is, will the House suspend the rules and pass the bill? Members will record their votes by electronic device. This is a 15-minute vote. The House voting now on a bill that would transfer an electrical distribution system to local ownership in South Utah Valley. One more vote after this one. The Senate held a couple of procedural votes related to the immigration bill today. Both of them passed with the number of votes needed to bring the bill to the floor. NBC News' Luke Russer sent out a tweet that says, Members of House Immigration Group tells me they think GOP leadership will shepherd bipartisan bill after rank-and-file vent, re-border security. And Umberto Sanchez of Roll Call tweets, Obama urges Congress to pass immigration bill by the end of the summer. President Obama spoke this morning in support of the immigration legislation, saying that the Senate bill is not perfect and no one will get everything they want, but that the bill would be an investment in border security and would give employers a reliable way to check whether those they're hiring are in the country legally. As this vote continues, here's the president in the East Room of the White House. Ladies and gentlemen, the President of the United States, accompanied by Tolu Olubumi. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> My name is Tolu Olubumi, and I'm a dreamer. When I was eight years old, I dreamed of being an engineer. At 14, I was brought from Africa to the U.S. to live that dream. At 21, I graduated with a chemical engineering degree, and today, that dream still lives in the back of my closet, where my diploma waits for immigration reform. I never set out to devote myself completely to advocating for immigration reform, nor did I imagine that out of the ashes of my darkest secret would arise my true purpose. In 2006, my father passed away in Nigeria. Too far for a final kiss goodbye and fearing that at any moment I could be torn away from my family. I stand here today as a direct result of the fervent prayers of my father and bold action by the president. Instead of living in fear and well below my abilities, I have the privilege 
of spending my days advocating for immigration reform and supporting efforts to achieve that more perfect union that we all desire, that we all desire. Mom, Dad, today I am hopeful and humbled to present the President of the United States. Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to the White House. Uh, it is a pleasure to have so many distinguished Americans uh, today from so many different walks of life. Uh, we've got Democrats and Republicans. We've got labor and business leaders up on stage. We have law enforcement and clergy. Uh, Americans who don't see eye to eye on every issue. In fact, in some cases, don't see eye to eye on just about any issue. <laughs> but who are today standing united in support of the legislation that is front and center in Congress this week, the bipartisan bill to fix our broken immigration system. And uh, I have to say, uh, please give Tolu another round of applause. It takes a lot of courage to do what uh, Tolu did, uh, to step out of the shadows, to share her story, and to hope that despite the risks, she could make a difference. Uh, but Tolu, I think, is representative of so many dreamers uh, out there who have uh, worked so hard, uh, and I've had a chance to meet so many of them who, who've been willing to give a face to the undocumented and have inspired a movement across uh, America. And with each step, they've reminded us time and again what this debate is all about. This is not an abstract debate. This is about incredible young people who understand themselves to be Americans, who have done everything right, uh, but have still been hampered in achieving their American dream. And they remind us that we're a nation of immigrants. Throughout our history, the promise we found in those who come from every corner of the globe has always been one of our greatest strengths. It's kept our workforce vibrant and dynamic. It's kept our businesses on the cutting edge. It's helped build the greatest economic engine that the world has ever known. When I speak to other world leaders, one of the biggest advantages we have economically is our demographics. We're constantly replenishing ourselves uh, with talent from all across the globe. No other country can match that history. And what was true uh, years ago is, is still true today. Who's beeping over there? <laughs> You're feeling kind of self-conscious, aren't you? <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> it, you know, in, in recent years, one in four of America's new small business owners were immigrants. One in four high-tech startups in America were founded by immigrants. 40% of Fortune 500 companies were started by first or second generation American. Think about that. Almost half of the Fortune 500 companies, when they were started, were started by first or second generation immigrants. So, so immigration isn't just part of our national character. It is a driving force in our economy that creates jobs and prosperity for all of our citizens. Now, here's the thing. Over the past two decades, our immigration system hasn't kept pace with changing times and hasn't matched up with our most cherished values. Right now, our immigration system invites the best and the brightest from all over the world to come and study at our top universities, and then once they finish, once they've gotten the training 
They need to build a new invention or create a new business. Our system too often tells them to go back home so that other countries can reap the benefits, the new jobs, the new businesses, the new industries. That's not smart, but that's the broken system we have today. Right now, our immigration system keeps families apart for years at a time. Even for folks who technically, under the legal immigration system, should be eligible to become citizens, but it is so long and so cumbersome, so Byzantine, that families end up being separated for years. Because of a backlog of visas, people who came here legally, who are ready to give it their all to earn their place in America, end up waiting for years to join their loved ones here in the United States. It's not right, but that's the broken system we have today. Right now, our immigration system has no credible way of dealing with the 11 million men and women who are in this country illegally. And yes, they broke the rules. They didn't wait their turn. They shouldn't be let off easy. They shouldn't be allowed to game the system. But at the same time, the vast majority of these individuals aren't looking for any trouble. They're just looking to provide for their families, contribute to their communities. They're our neighbors. We know their kids. Too often they're forced to do uh, what they do in a shadow economy where shady employers can exploit them by paying less than the minimum wage, making them work without overtime, not giving them any benefits. That pushes down standards for all workers. It's bad for everybody because all the businesses that do play by the rules, that hire people legally, that pay them fairly, they're at a competitive disadvantage. American workers end up being at a competitive disadvantage. It's not fair, but that's the broken system that we have today. Now, over the past four years, we've tried to patch up some of the worst cracks in the system. We made border security a top priority. Today, we have twice as many Border Patrol agents as we did in 2004. We have more boots on the ground along our southern border than at any time in our history. And in part, by using technology more effectively, illegal crossings are near their lowest level in decades. We focused our enforcement efforts on criminals who are here illegally and who are endangering our communities. And today, deportation of criminals is at its highest level ever. And having put border security in place, having refocused on those who could do our communities harm, we also then took up the cause of the dreamers, young people like Tula who, who were brought to this country as children. And we said that if you're able to meet some basic criteria like pursuing a higher education, then we'll consider offering you the chance to come out of the shadows so you can continue to work here and study here and contribute to our communities legally. So, so my administration has done what we can on our own. And we've got members of my administration here who've done outstanding work over the past few years uh, to try to close up some of the gaps that exist in the system. But the system's still broken. And to truly deal with this issue, Congress needs to act. And that moment is now. This week, the Senate will consider a common-sense, bipartisan bill that is the best chance we've had in years to fix our broken immigration system. It will build on what we've done and continue to strengthen our borders. It will make sure that businesses and workers are all playing by the same set of rules. And it includes tough penalties for those who don't. It's fair for middle class families by making sure that those who are brought into the system pay their fair share in taxes and for services. And it's fair for those who try to immigrate legally by stopping those who try to skip the line. It's the right thing to do. Now, this bill isn't perfect. It's a compromise. And going forward, nobody's going to get everything that they want. Not Democrats, not Republicans, not me. But this is a bill that's largely consistent with the principles that I and the people on this stage have laid out for common sense reform. 
First of all, if passed, this bill would be the biggest commitment to border security in our nation's history. It would put another $6.5 billion on top of what we're already spending towards stronger, smarter security along our borders. It would increase criminal penalties against smugglers and traffickers. It would finally give every employer a reliable way to check that every person they're hiring is here legally. And it would hold employers more accountable if they knowingly hire undocumented workers. So it strengthens border security, but also enforcement within our borders. I know there's a lot of talk right now about border security, so let me repeat. Today, illegal crossings are near their lowest level in decades. And if passed, the Senate bill, as currently written and is hidden on the floor, would put in place the toughest border enforcement plan that America has ever seen. So nobody's taking border enforcement lightly. That's part of this bill. Number two, this bill would provide a pathway to earned citizenship for the 11 million individuals who are in this country illegally. So that pathway is arduous. You've got to pass background checks. You've got to learn English. You've got to pay taxes and a penalty. And then you've got to go to the back of the line behind everybody who's done things the right way and have tried to come here legally. So this won't be a quick process. It'll take at least 13 years before the vast majority of these individuals are able to even apply for citizenship. So this is no cakewalk. But it's the only way we can make sure that everyone who's here is playing by the same rules as ordinary families, paying taxes and getting their own health insurance. That's why for immigration reform to work, it must be clear from the outset that there is a pathway to citizenship. If we're asking everybody to play by the same rules, you've got to give people a sense of certainty that they go through all these sacrifices, do all this, that there's, at the end of the horizon, the opportunity, not the guarantee, but the opportunity to be part of this American family. And by the way, a majority of Americans support this idea. Number three, this bill would modernize the legal immigration system so that alongside training American workers for the jobs of tomorrow, we're also attracting the highly skilled entrepreneurs and engineers from around the world who will ultimately grow our economy. And this bill would help make sure that our people don't have to wait years before their loved ones are able to join them here in America. So that's what immigration reform looks like. Smarter enforcement, a pathway to earn citizenship, improvements to our legal system. They're all common sense steps. They've got bipartisan support. They've got the support of a broad cross-section of leaders from every walk of life. So there's no reason Congress can't get this done by the end of the summer. Remember, the process that led to this bill was open and inclusive. For months, the bipartisan gang of eight looked at every issue, reconciled competing ideas, built a compromise that works. Then the Judiciary Committee held numerous hearings. More than 100 men amendments were added, often with bipartisan support. And the good news is every day that goes by, more and more Republicans and Democrats are coming out to support this common sense immigration reform bill. And I'm sure the bill will go through a few more changes uh, in the weeks to come. But this much is clear. If you genuinely believe we need to fix our broken immigration system, there's no good reason to stand in the way of this bill. A lot of people, Democrats and Republicans, have done a lot of good work on this bill. So if you're serious about actually fixing the system, then this is the vehicle to do it. If you're not serious about it, if, if, if you think that a broken system is the best America can do, then I guess it might make sense to try to block it. But if you're actually serious and sincere about 
fixing a broken system, this is the vehicle to do it. And now's the time to get it done. There is no good reason to play procedural games or engage in obstruction just to block the best chance we've had in years to address this problem in a way that's fair to middle class families, to business owners, to legal immigrants. And there's no good reason to undo the progress we've already made, especially when it comes to extreme steps like stripping protections from dreamers that my administration's provided, or asking law enforcement to treat them the same way they treat violent criminals. That's not who we are. We owe it to America to do better. We owe it to the dreamers to do better. We owe it to the young people like Tula and, and, and Diego Sanchez, who's, who's with us here today. Where's Diego? Right here. <clears throat> Diego came here from Argentina with his parents when he was just a kid. And growing up, America was his home. This is where he went to school. This is where he made friends. This is where he built a life. You ask Diego, and he'll tell you he feels American in every way, except one, on paper. In high school, Diego found out that he was undocumented. Think about that. With all the stuff you're already dealing with in high school, <laughs> and suddenly, oh, man. <laughs> really? So he had done everything right, stayed out of trouble, excelled in class, contributed to his community, feeling hopeful about his future, and suddenly he finds out he's got to live in fear of deportation. Watching his, his friends get their licenses, knowing he couldn't get one, seeing his classmates apply for summer jobs, knowing he couldn't do that either. When Diego heard that we were going to offer a chance for folks like him to emerge from the shadows, he went and signed up. All he wanted, he said, was a chance to live a normal life and to contribute to the country I love. And Diego this year was approved for deferred action. And a few weeks ago, he graduated from St. Thomas University, where he was student body president and student of the year. So now he's set his sights higher and master's degree and then law school so he can pursue a career in public policy, help America shape his future. Why wouldn't we want to do the right thing by Diego? What rationale is there out there that wouldn't want to make sure Diego achieves his dreams? Because if he does, that helps us all achieve our dreams. So in the weeks to come, you'll hear some opponents of immigration reform try to gin up fear and create division and spread the same old rumors and untruths that we've heard before. And when that happens, I want you to think about Tolu. I want you to think about Diego. Are 404. The nays are zero. Two-thirds being in the affirmative. The rules are suspended. The bill is passed. And without objection, the motion to reconsider is laid upon the table. The unfinished business is the vote on the motion of the gentleman from Washington, Mr. Hastings, to suspend the rules and pass H.R. 1157, on which the yeas and nays are ordered. The clerk will report the title of the bill. Union calendar number 69, H.R. 1157. A bill to ensure public asset access to the summit of Rattlesnake Mountain in the Hanford Reach National Monument for educational, recreational, historical, scientific, cultural, and other purposes. The question is, will the House suspend the rules and pass the bills? Members will record their votes by electronic device. This is a five-minute vote. The last vote of the day on a bill that instructs the Interior Department to provide public access to the 3,600-foot summit of Rattlesnake Mountain in Washington State. Coming up tomorrow in the House, work begins on the Defense Programs Bill. 
Today, uh, Defense Secretary Chuck Hagel and Joint Chiefs of Staff Chairman Martin Dempsey testified before a Senate Appropriations Subcommittee about the President's 2014 budget proposal. The chairman of the subcommittee, Dick Durbin, also asked Secretary Hagel about his plans to review military contractors in light of leaks about National Security Agency surveillance programs. Front page of newspapers all across the United States tells the story of Edward Snowden. Edward Snowden, who was an employee of Booz Allen, working for one of our premier national security agencies as a contract employee. The story that's told is that he was a high school dropout, that he didn't finish his military obligation, though he attempted, and dropped out of community college. And it's also reported that he was being paid in the range of $200,000 a year as a contract employee. Secretary Hagel, I continue to be concerned about the cost of contract, the contractor workforce not just in the NSA, but in the Department of Defense. Recent reports have again emphasized that the average contract employee costs two to three times as much as the average DOD civilian employee for performing similar work. According to DOD information from FY10, contract employees comprised 22% of your department's workforce, but accounted for 50% of its cost, $254 billion. So now let's take a look at what's happening when it comes to the treatment of the workforce. I wholeheartedly support the idea of exempting uniformed personnel from sequestration cuts. We owe it to these men and women, not to put a hardship on them when they are literally risking their lives for America. But then if we take a look at the civilian workforce in the Department of Defense, here's what we find. There's not been a civilian pay raise since 2011. So my question to you is this. If we're setting out to save money, has the civilian hiring freeze resulted in more or fewer contract employees? And if so, how are you tracking the cost ramifications? Has contractor pay in the Department of Defense increased during the civilian hiring freeze? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'll uh, defer the specific numbers uh, that you ask the questions to the Comptroller here in a moment. But uh, let me address your, your larger context of your question on contractors. Um, we are uh, currently reviewing all contractors, uh, all the contracts we have. We have no choice uh, for all the obvious uh, reasons. Uh, contractors uh, are part of any institution. You, we need them, uh, certain skills, certain expertise. Uh, but uh, there's no question that uh, we're going to have to make some uh, rather significant adjustments, which we are. And by the way, uh, the furlough process uh, does include contractors. It includes companies. It includes acquisitions. It includes contracts. Um, and your specific questions on, on the, the GAO uh, reports, uh, so on, I'll ask Mr. Hale to, re to respond. But let me make one other point. Um, I don't disagree with... Uh, any of your general analysis on contractors. Um, uh, I think when you look at the buildup over the last 12 years, and I was in this body uh, during a significant amount of that, uh, and uh, as that buildup occurred and the money uh, flowed in to uh, uh, different departments and institutions because we felt they were required for the national security of this country, uh, there will come a time, and it is now, where we're going to have to make some hard choices in the review of those. So you can see all of that hearing on C-SPAN tonight after the House is out and right now at C-SPAN.org. Secretary Hagel and Chairman Dempsey are back on Capitol Hill tomorrow morning before the Senate Budget Committee at 1030 Eastern. We'll have that live on C-SPAN 3. Also tomorrow, a Senate subcommittee will hold a hearing on cybersecurity with the head of the National Security Agency and representatives from the Homeland Security Department and the FBI. That's live at 2 p.m. Eastern, also on C-SPAN 3.
We just heard that the head of the National Security Agency will testify tomorrow morning at a hearing. All members of the House were invited to a closed-door briefing this afternoon on NSA surveillance programs. NBC's Luke Russer tweeted a picture saying members check their smartphones and bins before getting that briefing. And another one from David Beard of the Washington Post. 54,000 people have signed a White House petition to pardon NSA leaker Edward Snowden. Again, the information about that hearing tomorrow, it starts at 2 p.m. Eastern Time on C-SPAN 3. Mr. Harper. Mr. Harper votes aye. On this vote, the yeas are 409, the nays are zero, two-thirds being in the affirmative. The rules are suspended. The bill is passed, and without objection, the motion to reconsider is laid upon the table. For what purpose does the gentleman from Texas seek recognition? Mr. Speaker, I send to the desk a privileged resolution and ask for its immediate consideration in the House. The clerk will report the resolution. House Resolution 255 resolves that the clerk of the House of Representatives requests the Senate to return to the House the bill H.R. 2217 entitled An Act Making Appropriations for the Department of Homeland Security for the fiscal year ending September 30th, 2014 and for other purposes. Is there objection to the consideration of the resolution? Without objection, the resolution is agreed to and the motion to reconsider is laid upon the table. The House will be in order. Members, please take your conversations off the floor. The House will be in order. The House will be in order. The chair is now prepared to entertain one minute requests. For what purpose does the gentleman from Pennsylvania seek recognition? Um, Madam Speaker, request unanimous consent to address the House for one minute, revise and extend. Without objection, the gentleman is recognized for one minute. The House will be in order. Please take your conversations off the floor. <coughs> Please take your conversations off the floor. The gentleman from Pennsylvania is recognized.
Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, Friday's job report clearly reminds us that the number one issue remains jobs and the economy. Every day, the House majority fights for solutions to grow the economy by advancing an all-the-above energy plan, promoting a fair and simpler tax code, and, and making it easier for families and students to afford college. On May 23rd, the House passed H.R. 1911, the Smarter Solutions for Students Act, a bill based on President's 2014 budget request that would provide a market-based interest rate for student loans <coughs> excuse me, and prevent the scheduled <coughs> rate hike on July 1st. Rather than encouraging the Senate to join the House in this good faith effort, the President chose politics over students and threatened to veto for a solution that is based on his own proposal. From student loans to reliable jobs, Americans want a strong economy and a more secure future. We can deliver on this, Madam Speaker, but only if the President starts leading and the Senate stops campaigning and both start working for the greater good of the American people. And I yield back. Pardon? The gentleman yields back. For what purpose does the gentlewoman from New Hampshire seek recognition? Uh, Madam Chair, I ask unanimous consent to revise and extend my remarks and to address the House for one minute. Without ob objection, the gentlewoman is recognized for one minute. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Sexual assault in our military is nothing short of a crisis. We owe it to our men and women in uniform and to our veterans, too, to do all that we can in the United States Congress to prevent military sexual violence, to improve medical services for survivors, and to hold attackers accountable. We must safeguard those who report these crimes and ensure that they are not retaliated against for doing the right thing. That is why I am a proud sponsor of a bipartisan bill H.R. 1864, which is included in the House National Defense Authorization Act we are voting on this very week. Introduced by my good friends and colleagues on both sides of the aisle, Congresswoman Jackie Walorski and Loretta Sanchez, this important legislation would strengthen protections for whistleblowers who report sexual violence in the military. This reform has bipartisan support in both chambers, 102 co-sponsors in the House, and the strong backing of many of the new representatives who are focused on working across the aisle to actually get things done. I urge my colleagues to support H.R. 1864 and to continue working together to end sexual violence in our military. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I yield back the balance of my time. Your time has expired. Thank you. And for what purpose does the gentleman from Minnesota seek recognition? Ask unanimous consent to address the House for one minute and revise and extend my remarks. Without objection, objection, the gentleman is recognized for one minute. Madam Speaker, I just want to recognize a true American hero, World War II veteran Jerry Noss. After enlisting in the U.S. Army shortly after Pearl Harbor, Jerry served for the duration of the war in the 1st Infantry Division, nicknamed the Big Red One. He served as a wire troubleshooter and risked his life time and time again to, assure that, uh, to ensure that communication lines remained intact. Jerry, who is a native Minnesotan, led a distinguished military career and exhibited immense bravery, landing on the beaches of Normandy on D-Day and fighting through Europe, including in the Battle of the Bulge. Because of his heroic action, actions, Jerry has now been named a Knight of the Legion of Honor by French President Hollande. The Legion of Honor is the highest decoration in France and commemorates the remarkable military service. It's important that we always remember our nation's veterans and keep those who still serve in our thoughts and prayers. I'd like to thank Jerry Noss for his service and congratulate on him on a much-deserved honor. You make Minnesota proud. And I yield back. The gentleman yields back. For what purpose does the gentleman from South Carolina seek recognition? Madam Speaker, I ask unanimous consent to address the House for one minute, revise and extend my remarks. Without objection, the gentleman is recognized for one minute. Madam Speaker, when Dogwood Stables Palace Malice of Aiken, South Carolina, won the 145th running of the Belmont Stakes Saturday, he fulfilled all the promise that Dogwood's president, Cot Campbell, foresaw in the Colt. As Palace Malice crossed the finish line with the defending first place, Victory, the people of Aiken County, identified by the New York Times as one of the world's greatest equestrian centers of excellence, were overjoyed by the horse's accomplishment. 
Congratulations to W. Catherine Cott Campbell, president of the Dogwood Stables, and his wife Ann, his partners Paul Arafais, Mike Schneider, Margaret Smith, Carl Myers, and Charlie Pig, Todd Pletcher, who trained the award-winning horse for the race after he departed Aiken, jockey Mike Smith, who rode Palace Malice to victory, and Brad Stouffer, the individual responsible for training the horse over the Aiken training track. Palace Malice continues a winning tradition to be trained over the Aiken training track and win the third jewel of the Thoroughbreds Racing Triple Crown as Danzig Connection won the Belmont Stakes in 1986. The Aiken Standard today correctly identified this, quote, as a win for every single, single Aiken resident. In conclusion, God bless our troops and we will never forget September 11th and the global war on terrorism. <laughs> For what purpose does the gentleman from Florida seek recognition? Madam Speaker, I sent to the desk a privileged report from the Committee on Rules for filing under the rule. The clerk will report the title. Report to accompany House Resolution 256, resolution providing for consideration of the bill, H.R. 1960, to authorize appropriations for fiscal year 2014 for military activities of the Department of Defense and for military construction to prescribe military personnel strengths for such fiscal year and for other purposes and providing for consideration of the bill, H.R. 1256, to direct the Securities and Exchange Commission and the Commodity Futures Trading Commission to jointly adopt rules setting forth the application to cross-border swaps, transactions of certain provisions relating to swaps that were enacted as part of the Dodd-Frank Wall Street Reform and Consumer Protection Act. Referred to the House calendar and ordered printed. The chair lays before the House the following personal requests. Leaves of absence requested for Mr. Bishop of New York for today and Mr. Lamborn of Colorado for today. Without objection, the requests are granted. <coughs> Under the Speaker's announced policy of January 3, 2013, the gentleman from New Jersey, Mr. Smith, is recognized for 60 minutes as the designee of the Majority Leader. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, last week New Jersey lost its senior senator and the Senate lost its last remaining World War II veteran when Senator Frank Lautenberg passed away at the age of 89. He died from complications from viral pneumonia in New York Presbyterian Hospital. Since then, on this floor, on multiple occasions, in the United States Senate, throughout the state of New Jersey, and frankly across the nation, all of us have paused to express our deepest respect for Senator Lautenberg and sorrow on his passing. To Senator Lautenberg's family, his wife Bonnie, his six children, and his 13 grandchildren, Please accept our deepest condolences and our prayers. Senator Lautenberg served five terms in the U.S. Senate on behalf of the people of the state of New Jersey. He was first elected to the Senate in 1982, re-elected in 88 and 94. After a brief retirement, Senator Lautenberg made an unexpected comeback and won a fourth term in 2002 and was again re-elected in 08. In December of 2011, he cast his 9,000th 9, 9, vote and now holds the record for the most votes ever cast by a New Jersey senator. While serving in the Senate, Frank Lautenberg became a leader on public health and safety issues. He led the effort to ban smoking on airplanes with the enactment of Public Law 101-164 and will forever be remembered for his efforts to protect individuals and children from secondhand smoke. Frank Lautenberg also fought for transportation and improvements in chemical plant safety. As the author of the Lautenberg Amendment, he worked to assist members from historically persecuted groups with a credible fear of persecution to qualify for refugee status, including religiously persecuted Soviet Jews. He also fought for the relief for the victims of terrorist attacks, including the first responders who experienced health complications after the 9-11 attacks and with the families and communities across our state recently devastated by Superstorm Sandy. Senator Lautenberg was, as I said, the last veteran of the World War II, uh, the greatest generation, part of the generation to serve in the U.S. Senate. 
the son of poor immigrants. He enlisted in the Army to serve his country in uniform, went to school on the GI Bill, began a successful business, and then ran for the Senate to, to in his words, quote, pursue a career in public service and to give back to the country that helped give him so very much. Senator Lauberg has been a mainstay of New Jersey politics for decades, and with his passing, the Senate and our state has lost a dedicated public servant. I'd like to now yield to the former mayor of, of Patterson, a good friend and colleague, uh, the Congressman uh, Bill Pasquale. Thank you, Madam, Madam Speaker, and thank you, uh, Congressman Smith, for your great service to your state and your country. Madam Speaker, we've lost a great man. When Senator Lautenberg passed away Monday morning, last Monday, I lost a good friend. The Silk City has produced many great individuals and characters alike, but few, if any, have a life story like that of Frank Lautenberg. Like me, Frank grew up on the streets of Patterson, literally. Both of us came from families of immigrants who came to Patterson, like, like pilgrims, like Plymouth Rock. It was Patterson, Plymouth Rock. That's what it was when you come down to it. We had the same dreams. Many thousands in our city had the same dream. Through hard work and determination, we learned that you could provide your children with a better life and a successful future. Despite all their dreams for their young son, I don't think that Sam and Molly Lautenberg, Frank's beautiful parents, deceased, ever could have imagined all that Frank would eventually achieve, only in America. But then again, Frank never forgot the sacrifices his family made for him. He learned what real hard work was from his father, who labored in the silk mills of Patterson to provide for his family. He learned how to persevere with his mother, who raised him in the face of poverty. I mean, they lived four or five different places in Patterson as they moved around. And as his dad passed away when he was, his dad was 43 years of age, in the face of poverty. Then at the age of 19, Frank Lautenberg had to summon all those lessons and more. When his father passed away, leaving him to support the entire family. He never forgot those hard lessons. They served him well throughout all the journeys of his life. He spoke about those journeys every time he came before a classroom in Patterson, New Jersey. He visited, revisited, and revisited. Brought computers. Brought computers. And of course, ADP was one of the great corporations in America, formed in a garage <laughs> in the back of a house in Patterson, New Jersey. And I say, Madam Speaker, how many people must be kicking themselves for not having invested way back when, but they thought it was a wild idea, taking care of people's payroll. It's not easy to grow up on the streets of Patterson, New Jersey. Take it from me personally, Congressman Smith. You have to fight for every inch in order to get ahead. Frank truly embodied what it means to be a fighter. That's what made him such a successful representative from New Jersey. And you've heard the congressman, Congressman Smith, spe specify all of the issues that he was involved in. And when he was involved, he was totally immersed in the subject area to help Americans. It didn't matter what nationality, what ethnicity, what color. It didn't matter what religion. It mattered that you were a human being in the greatest country in the world. He talked about it often. When he came back from the service, he talked about it. He served his country in the Second World War. You know, regardless of how you feel on issues, you don't take on the gun lobby 
to ban firearms for domestic violence offenders. You don't take on big tobacco to ban smoking on airplanes without getting a few scars in the process. The thing Frank's opponents didn't realize was that he got his scars long ago growing up on the streets of Patterson, New Jersey. His roots are exactly what made Frank so successful, first in the Army, then in the private sector, and finally in the hallowed halls of the U.S. Senate. But despite all that he achieved, he never forgot where he came from. Ah, that's the secret. When you forget where you came from, when you forget your roots, when you forget the street you lived on, the guys and the gals that you talked to, your mom and dad had they sweated out every day. I mean, when you worked in those silk mills, that was no day at the beach, not by any stretch of the imagination. We many times forget our roots, Congressman Smith, and you know that. We forget where we came from. We think we're better. If you're a congressman, oh, God. He never forgot where he came from. Despite all that, of what he achieved, he knew his roots. One of the proudest moments of my career was standing shoulder to shoulder with him when we were able to successfully pass legislation to finally establish the Great Falls National Historic Park in Patterson, New Jersey. It's our Yellowstone. It's our Grand Canyon. It doesn't take up nearly the amount of space, but it meant so much to not only Pattersonians, but people in that area. Patterson, the third largest city, first industrial city. Alexander Hamilton knew what he was doing. Frank Lautenberg knew what he was doing. We've been pushing many, many years for federal recognition. In fact, I still have a picture hanging in my office of Senator Lautenberg and I touring the Great Falls when I was the mayor of that city. In the true Patterson spirit, despite opposition from the Park Service, we weren't getting off to a good start. <laughs> and opponents in Congress who never wanted to see an urban national park we never stopped fighting. And just a few years ago, we finally reached our dream to get the Great Falls, the federal designation it deserves. Members of both sides of the aisle came together. And on that day, when Secretary Salazar was there, Democrats and Republicans joined together where industry started in this great nation. The park is now in the first stages of its development. And I believe one day it will be a crown jewel in the national park system, thanks in no small part to our great senator. It's a fitting legacy for him to leave to the city he loves so much. These last few months, with his health getting weaker, necessitating long absences from the Senate, Frank never lost his passion for the issues he had spent his entire life defending. Despite his health, he came to Washington to cast a critical vote on a bill to expand background checks. No one was going to stop Frank Lautenberg from fighting to make this world a better place. Even the limitations of his own body couldn't hold him back. I joined my friends and neighbors in Patterson, where he used to cut his hair Pasadena Pete. We used to stop at the markets, and he'd stop into a coffee shop down, downtown. We mourn this tremendous loss of one of our favorite sons, one of our patriots. He was a person first. He was a legislator second. He was the same man on the street that he was on the Senate floor. You always got the genuine article. Frank Lautenberg was not a spectator to life. Frank Lautenberg was a leader, a loving husband, a loving father, a trusted friend, and a true Pattersonian. And with that, I yield back. Uh, Mr. Pascal, I want to thank you for your very eloquent, very eloquent remembrances of Senator Frank Lautenberg and for your wonderful insights.
uh, especially as the former mayor and someone who has known him so intimately and so well for so many years. It was, thank you so very much thank for you. that. I'd like to now yield uh, to my friend and colleague, Mr. Payne. Thank you. I want to thank my colleague, Congressman Smith, for hosting this special order today. Madam Speaker, I come before you today saddened by the passing of a fellow New Jerseyan. He was a dear friend and colleague, the honorable and venerated senator from New Jersey, Senator Frank Lautenberg. If anyone could embody the actual definition of the American dream, it would be Frank Lautenberg. Born the son of Russian and Polish immigrants in Patterson, New Jersey, he grew up during the Great Depression. When war hit our shores, he bravely served the country he loved in World War II, and he was the last of our senators to do so. When he returned home from war, Senator Lautenberg earned his degree on the GI Bill, which he later staunchly advocated for the extension of for our current men and women in uniform, and never taking for granted the opportunities that lay before him after his graduation he and three of his friends, with just an idea and an entrepreneurial spirit, began an extremely successful company, ADP. If you get a payroll check these days, it is likely ADP printed your check. I guess you could say Senator Lautenberg was a proof that anything is possible if you firmly believe in what you're doing and what you put your mind to. Later, he seamlessly transitioned from CEO of ADP to public servant, often demonstrating determination, grit, and leadership throughout his time in office that came to define Frank Lautenberg. Throughout his five terms in office, Senator Lautenberg never forgot his roots. He was a committed, committed advocate for the working middle class that he was a product of. And as a senator, as Senator Lautenberg knew best, we've got to open doors and not slam them shut. And he, and he always practiced this outlook, no matter what that he set to achieve. He tirelessly worked to make health care and, and, and higher education more affordable for working and middle class families. Even into his later years, Senator Lautenberg was one of the leading progressives on social issues. Thanks to Senator Lautenberg and his tremendous environmental work, we have cleaner water to drink and cleaner air to breathe. He was also recognized early on the proliferation of gun violence in our communities and the damage it was doing to our children and families. As a champion of gun safety legislation, he made our neighborhoods a safer place to work and live. And nothing was going to keep Senator Lautenberg from casting a critical vote on background checks on gun purchases this past spring. Though the late senator did not get to witness the successful passage of this legislation, the fight in Washington will continue as we carry out the work of Senator Lautenberg's vision to keep our families and our children safer. In closing, I want to extend my deepest sympathies to Bonnie, his daughters that I was able to meet last week, and his grandchildren. I had the honor of attending Senator Lautenberg's final tribute last week, and it was clear from that beautiful ceremony the incredible impact Senator Lautenberg has had on so many lives. Senator Frank Lautenberg had a love of life and a commitment to the people of New Jersey that will be deeply missed in the halls of Congress and in New Jersey. He was a great mentor to me, especially as the newest member of the New Jersey delegation. I'll never, I will forever be grateful for his guidance and for all his tremendous work he did for New Jersey and our great nation. We owe him an immense debt of gratitude for making New Jersey a better place to live. There is no doubt 
Senator Lautenberg will certainly be missed, and I yield back. <clears throat> Mr. Payne, thank you very much for your moving words and sentiments expressed today. And I would ask uh, that unanimous consent that all members have five legislative days in which to revise and extend their remarks and include extraneous material on the subject of uh, this special order. Without objection. Thank you. Yield thank back. you. The gentleman yields back. Under the Speaker's announcement,